Hello, and welcome to the Proactive Caregiving Podcast. As a CPA with over 20 years as an industry accountant, Jessica stepped away from the corporate world to become a full-time caregiver for her mother. Having learned invaluable lessons along the way, she is now here to share those with you and to invite you to join her on this caregiver's journey. Here is your host, Jessica Cannon. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're here with me today. I am a proactive caregiver, and I specialize in educating others on how to be proactive by empowering you, the caregiver. If you cannot take care of yourself, then you cannot take care of your loved one. You know, many of you know I found myself taking that last statement to heart when I took time off to heal from lower back surgery this past April. Although it was the most serious and invasive procedure I have ever experienced, it did not make me think of death or dying. Even when the hospital administration and nurses asked about having an advanced directive, I still did not think about death or my usual what-if anxiety-driven thought patterns. No, those thoughts came later when I had what was called a provoked pulmonary embolism one month to the day after my surgery. Then the thoughts of words left unsaid, relationships left in turmoil, and mom's care, her care needs with my own mortality came crashing in as I was gasping for air. Experiencing dad's last few weeks alive as his body battled pneumonia made this kind of conversation about death, which we avoided so many times before, it suddenly became uncomfortably necessary with an intense weight of a pending reality. None of the decisions my sisters and I were faced with were expected or were anything we were prepared to do at the time or make. Growing up, these conversations were usually treated with sarcasm. They just didn't have to worry about death because (laughs) once they were dead, they were dead. Not much thought went into what we needed as their children, what we would need or what they wanted as part of their journey home. And just to be clear, you know, talking about death, it does not manifest it, but preparing for it while giving your family a chance to be on the same page is so important. Aside from terminal illness, no one knows when their day will come, but we can proactively face death without fear by working with an end of life doula like Melissa would. Before her work as a doula, She spent the last 25 years in naturopathic medicine and massage. She was helping people live a healthier life, naturally. Melissa created her company, Peaceful End of Life, to focus on providing patient advocacy and compassionate guidance towards a peaceful end of life. And that is exactly why I wanted to have Melissa on with me today. Thank you for joining me, Melissa. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. So, you know, I'm, I mentioned that I had my moment, my fear. Have you noticed that working with people, that this conversation is avoided more often than not um, on death and dying? It, it absolutely is. You know, especially here in the West, You know, I'm not really sure if we're not talked about it in schools or at home, um, but it's an interesting thing to observe that we avoid talking about it. We all act as though, well, it's not going to be my time, you know, and this this isn't going to happen to me. And, and, you know, heaven forbid you should talk about my parents getting ill because, you know, they're not going to get ill and they're not going to die either. You know, nobody wants to be realistic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're all going to die. I'm I'm sorry. (laughs) You know, um, we are, we are going to, we're human beings and that is this process. And Mm -hmm. certainly we can live a healthier life and try to avoid that day, but we shouldn't avoid the conversations around it. Um, It is scary, but it doesn't have to be. And that's, that's part of what I want to do is to have those conversations with people to help alleviate their fears and the unknown things that they don't even know about Mm -hmm. and just to 
make it so that it's it's not a scary topic. We can be well informed about this, especially as we might have parents or family members that are um, approaching the you know a, a lo- an older age where death is going to be more talked about. Mm-hmm. It, it it doesn't have to be not talked about. It should be talked about, um, and that gives us power. It gives us knowledge. That information helps us to be able to handle things from a place of strength as opposed to, oh my gosh, I'm in an emergency situation. And not only am I stressed out, I'm emotional. Mm -hmm. My family's emotional. Nobody knows what to say or ask or do. Mm -hmm. Preparing for those kind of things ahead of time takes all that away. And and you're of course going to be emotional, but you can think clearer. Exactly. And I know one thing that I do want to kind of make a little bit clearer is that even as we're talking about this and as you're explaining this, I just wonder if we do have listeners that would automatically get confused because they're thinking, well, isn't that what hospice services are? Can you explain a little bit to me the difference between hospice and the end of life doula? Sure, sure. Um, First of all, hospice um, for for those people that, that, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, have a misconception about hospice, and they they automatically kind of think, well, hospice means somebody's imminently dying in the mm-hmm. next week or in the next month, and that's not the case. Um, hospice can be involved um, from any time currently until somebody uh, has a diagnosis that they might be passing away within six months or even a year. They can still be involved in that patient's care. But the main difference between us is hospice is going to be providing medical care. There is going to be a physician on staff. The patient may not see that physician, but there is going to be somebody behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, There's going to be a nurse. Um, There's going to be medication, most often morphine or, you know, comfort medications for the patient. Those types of things are all done by hospice from a medical standpoint. They might come once or twice a week um, to visit with the patient, maybe for you know 30 minutes at a time. Mm-hmm. An end-of-life doula does not do anything medical. Most of us don't have typical medical training. We might have a nursing background. There's a lot of doulas that have been nurses. But in the doula role, our role is not to provide nursing care. Our role is to provide end of life support, emotional support, spiritual support, companionship. We are there as much as the patient or their family wants us there. Um, Sometimes that means every day. Sometimes that means for a 14 hour vigil, um, which I have done myself. Um, So it really just depends on the family, the patient, what they, how, what, what kind of support they need, if they need um, support helping to plan a funeral. They, they don't even know where to start. Right. Um, they don't know about all the different options for a body at the end of life. Mm. Hospice is not really going to provide any of those types of services. Again, they're there to offer medical support and nursing support. Um, doulas are there for more spiritual and emotional support. So that's kind of the main difference. Interesting. Very interesting. And that's why I, I noticed one of the things that came about on your uh, website was you pointed out specifically about being, bringing non-judgmental support regardless of religious belief lifestyle or even as a member of LGBTQ community as a doula. Do you feel that people sometimes their beliefs are what inhibit them from accepting this process of dying and how to cope and deal with it? I think that Unfortunately, especially for LGBTQ people, it's not a belief necessarily, but it is a, unfortunately, they don't get the level of care. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, I mean, some of that is starting to change. You know, we've had quite the movement over the last several years. Some of that's starting to change quite a bit, but there's still a pretty big gap. I mean, there are still people that don't want it to be known that they're part of the LGBTQ community and they may not be married and their, and their partner um, is prohibited from knowing medical situations and things like that. So again, from a doula perspective, I'm going to service that client and whatever religious beliefs they have, their lifestyle, their family, 
um, to the best of my ability. I, I don't have judgment about those things. I do find sometimes that people, I've had it both ways where sometimes people are super, super religious mm -hmm. and absolutely terrified about dying. Um, and I've had other people be super, super religious and are completely at peace with it mm -hmm. and, you know, just ready for the next step, if you will. Right. So it really, I have not found that it's, you know, somebody's position on death is based on, you know, whether they're part of a certain type of community or they have a certain lifestyle or whether they have a certain religion. It's, everybody's different and everybody comes from a different background. They were raised differently. You know, we've often got family and ancestral stuff that is, you know, been on us for our lifetime so right. sometimes that's where some of that comes from not necessarily religious background and and other things true. does that make sense yeah very very okay. true and i also noticed too we actually had an opportunity to speak previously and i'm just wondering how much of this um your background influenced your desire to create peaceful end of life can you tell me a little bit of how you experienced your own um, health issues and how that came about for your own issues of death and dying? Sure. Um, you know, my background is that I was uh, born to older parents. So while I was still in my 20s, I had to deal with both my parents getting ill and dying mm -hmm. um, and, and fairly close to one another. Um, and then I had my own uh, cancer scare right after my mother had passed away. So there was a lot of death in a relatively short period of time when I was still really young. And of course, at that time, you know, didn't know anything about doulas or anything like that. That part came much later in my life. But it definitely, uh, going through the cancer scare myself and certainly the illnesses with both of my parents and their subsequent deaths, um, certainly helped form, um, you know, it, it got me into natural medicine, certainly. So that that is what prompted me on that path. Hmm. But it also, you know, gave me a look at the things that happen at the end of the life and the things I don't, you know, I saw that I definitely don't want to have happen to me. Um, so I've, you know, just made some, some, you know, lifestyle changes. And my mother had, you um, liver and lung cancer and my father died from alzheimer's and i actually have the gene for alzheimer's mm. but it's not a it's not a guarantee that you'll even get it so right. there are lifestyle things or supplements um so you know that death certainly had an impact on my life and has made me make different choices absolutely i think that's the biggest takeaway from a lot of my experiences um like when my dad passed and trying to really experience the loss and grief but two mm -hmm. days within his death we had funeral arrangements and burial ground trying to decide where to, to have him buried and the stone what to put on the headstone I mean just these details that I didn't want to have to think about it I didn't want to have to deal with it, it yes it was a, a grim reality but at the same time I didn't know any of that information until it was smacked face on head on with it Sure. It's, it's shocking. And, you know, again, you, you've got to make decisions, um, typically in, in a relatively short period of time. Um, mm -hmm. so it's, it can be often, you know, super traumatic and especially for, you know, families with you know, lots of siblings and, you know, cousins, and there's a lot of involvement. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be difficult for families for sure. And that's why I'm, you know, incur that's why we're talking. We, we want to educate people about, you don't, you doesn't have to, you don't have to wait till the last minute right. and you, you can get information ahead of time. And, and especially if you've got a parent that maybe even has a cancer diagnosis and it isn't negative or it isn't, you're not thinking about failure to think about, well, what happens if my, if my parent doesn't survive this, mm -hmm. um, that's not being negative. That's being, you know, kind of proactive about, you know, look, I better have a plan. I better have questions, um, particularly from a financial perspective, if they don't have yes. their wills done and, you know, mm -hmm. things like that, that needs to be done ahead of time. Exactly. So that, that's why we're talking. We want to educate people about not waiting till the last minute when it's 
stressful like what you went through. Right. And that's where these kind of conversations are always going to be uncomfortable. No one wants to think about their loved one dying or their spouse or their child. But Correct. when when you're in these moments, it's it's almost it's too late to have that conversation of um, especially in the scenario that I was in, dad dying from pneumonia, he, in the last couple of days, he had a tracheotomy and he was completely, um, unresponsive. And so we couldn't ask dad, do you want this? Yeah. Dad, do you want that? Do you prefer? And then yeah. making the decisions of comfort care, it was just, we were at that point, you know, and that's why I love that you explain with your services, being able to help these people in the medical situations and, being able to know what questions to ask. Because in those scenarios, for me, I didn't know what questions to ask. It was all mm -hmm. reactive, not any type of proactive approach to it at that point. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of, I went through, you know, something similar with my dad when he was ill and advancing in his Alzheimer's and he had a little stroke and as a result of that, he lost the ability to swallow. And he already was at the point where he was not communicating verbally very much. Um, but, um, and certainly didn't know me, but you know, then now, now we can't swallow. Now we can't eat. Mm -hmm. Um, and at the time, you know, I had just lost my mother. I was dealing with my own cancer stuff. Um, and the surgeons came to me and said, you know, we have to put in a stomach tube. And, and, you know, I was like, well, okay, you know, let's do that. And, you know, little did I know, I didn't know the questions to ask mm -hmm. and them telling me that we have to put in a stomach tube actually wasn't true. I could have made the decision not to do that because he was already at a very advanced stage mm -hmm. and all the stomach tube did was, you know, make his advanced stage last that much longer. Right. So we've got to know about questions to ask medical professionals, particularly if they're not going to be forthcoming with all the possible scenarios and all the possible outcomes. And sometimes they just don't know to say all that and nobody's asking um, but those are things we need to have. Those conversations need to happen with medical, particularly, preferably before there's a crisis, like what you went through. Oh, no kidding. And it's, it's that scary scenario. I mean, I remember growing up, we've had family members that would suggest that my parents get us uh, pets, goldfish, hamster, rabbit, or dog or something so that we as we were children, we would experience the feeling of loss and understanding what that means. But mm -hmm. at that point in time, you're learning how to care and grieve. You're not learning the preparation of what that death is going to be and what the mm -hmm. after effects are going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, fortunately now we've got, you know, there's a lot more information on bereavement and grief and there's more support groups, but, you know, I understand they meant well, as far as, you know, Hey, you need to experience this, mm -hmm. but we need a follow-up plan, right? Right. right. <laughs> yes. And, and a follow-up plan that's appropriate for the age, because I didn't deal with death until I was in my early twenties and it was a family, not a family member. It was an actual close friend to the family. And mm. Being uh, around uh, a dead body in a funeral home was even uncomfortable. It's just, it's those things that you don't, it's not the day-to-day -day things that you would normally experience and knowing yeah. what to expect and um, what was allowed, what was accepted, what was respected and what was understood. I saw people walking up to a casket and kissing the body. And I just thought that's the, the weirdest thing to me. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, there's so many things out there that until they happen, these conversations are, could be those starters to just, let's not be afraid of this, which is why I love that you had explained to me that they, there are such things called death cafes. Yes. Can you yes. tell me more about that? So our listeners can understand what a death cafe is. You know, death cafes are, they are nationwide and, and just for your audience, you can go to deathcafe.com and they are basically held um, in pretty much all major cities across the country and probably internationally. I'm not, I, you know, I would imagine there's international locations, but it's basically a group of people that will get together, you know, maybe once a month at a cafe and you know, maybe a coffee shop or a restaurant or something. 
and meet and have conversations about death and dying. Not about grief. This mm -hmm. is not a grief support group. This is a, you know, death, talking about death um, in, in, a, in a way that's going to be really positive and that, you know, there's going to be a mediator. Typically, there's a host that's got some thoughtful questions that they could ask people things to think about. Um, I know like a very common uh, topic is medical aid in dying. Mm -hmm. um, that's certainly something that it comes up frequently in death cafes because, you know, currently there's only 11 states that have that um, option. Mm -hmm. And so it certainly is something that's talked about. And the more people suffer at the end of life and the more people see the suffering mm -hmm. the more this is coming out that people want to have these discussions yes. but death cafes are super um positive places to go to just even just sit and listen and of course with covid many of them went to um zoom yeah. um so you can i mean i attend a death cafe that's in north carolina that's hosted by a fellow doula of mine so, you know, there, you, you can go to one, even if there's not one where you live, you can probably find one online somewhere that you could attend and you can just go and sit and listen. And it's, it's, there's always going to be an interesting conversation, but it's a super supportive place to go where somebody can just have a conversation about, you know, Hey, you know, somebody's dying and, mm -hmm you know, what kind of support could they get? Maybe they, they don't know about the fact that there are other ways to uh, handle the body as opposed to, you know, putting somebody in a casket in the ground or getting cremated. People often don't know that there's probably 10 or 11 other ways to mm. have the body processed. However, you know, many different ways that they might want to. So it's a death cafes are amazing and they're really great places for people to start out on the death talk in a nice, friendly way. Interesting. Especially if it's difficult to have those conversation with their family members, at least they have sure. an outlet, a positive outlet that they can go to and ask the questions and yes. hear other stories and go by their responses. Yes. And you know, and that's why I love, that's another piece of nugget of information you shared with me as well is the documentary on Netflix called extreme measures. Um, yes. Finding a Better Path by Dr. Jessica Zeter. This is something, and it was, I highly recommend the listeners to watch it if they get a chance to. Um, this is exactly that perfect example of what happens when people avoid these conversations of death and dying and wishes for their death. When the family members are struggling by their bedside, whether it's at in their home or in a hospital, not knowing what to do and, and emotionally not wanting to let go. Not yes. knowing when to say, okay, they're on this terminal path. There is no amount of um, medical intervention that can actually stop this path at this point. And so that's in itself is difficult. That documentary by Dr. Zitter is um, really quite, it's very, it's very short. It's like mm -hmm. 25 minutes. Right. Um, and I actually want to make a correction to you. Her book is called Extreme Measures, gotcha. Finding a Better Path, but the film on Netflix is actually called Extremis. That's right. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, Thank just, you for that. Just so your folks can find it. Um, and, you know, especially given what's happened to all of us in the last year with COVID, mm -hmm. there is no waiting um, oh, I'm only 20 or, oh, I'm only 30. Yes. I don't need to think about these things yet. Exactly. That is not true any longer. No. Mm -mm. Um, everybody needs to think about these things. Um, everybody needs a will. Everybody needs, you know, some kind of plan for their children, for finances, for assets, mm -hmm. all those kind of things need to be discussed. So, you know, back before COVID, you know, if you're, if you're under 40, yeah, you probably don't really need to think about this, you know, just a lot. Um, right. But COVID has changed the landscape. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, watching that documentary, and there's others, there's a lot of documentaries on on death and dying mm -hmm. that we can learn from that can make, you know, you just don't want to have your children sitting at a bedside trying to figure out what to do for you. Right. That's, I mean, and, you know, like you said about your dad, you're trying to, you're trying to navigate this traumatic 
extremely stressful time Mm -hmm. without having the information that you need. Um, So you want to try to have these conversations ahead of time so you don't have to go through that. Exactly. Making those decisions and then having the guilt afterwards. Is that what he really would have wanted? Should we have done this? Should we have said that? Should we have gone this other direction? It's, I think it took uh, at least two years after he passed before I was starting to finally feel comfortable and accepting the decisions that were made as they were made in the real time, but it still haunted me afterwards. Well, sure. Because, you know, you didn't know and, you know, you weren't, you you know, unless you had that conversation, not ever positive. So it's normal to go and second guess and question and, you know, think about and, and, um, I mean, that is, that is very normal, but, um, you know, the only thing I can say is you absolutely made the best, you know, choices and decisions that you could have at the time with the information that you've had. Right. Um, uh, we can only ever do as much as we have the information to do with. So, um, but again, why we're talking today is to encourage people mm-hmm. to not be afraid to talk and, Um, it's such a beautiful thing when you can sit down with your family and get these conversations out in the open so that everybody's on the same page. Exactly. It is. And there's, there's, there's easy ways to do that. There's card games, there's books, there's questions, you know, there's somebody like me that can attend a zoom, you know, session on long distance and talk to the family. I mean, there's a lot of ways to be supportive and and talk um, with family. So it can be done. Yes, it can be done and it needs to be done. Because I know growing up, my dad used to joke about dying, um, saying, just bury me in a pine box. You know, don't spend any money on me. And then my mom would turn around and say, just put me in a red dress and play Louisiana style music to celebrate my life. That was it. (laughs) There you go. But those conversations, go. I mean, they were, I just looking back on them, they were the, the funny, weird conversations as an adolescent, but getting that conversation going as an adult and feeling comfortable with it, no matter, especially when our, our parents, you know, like you mentioned COVID and that age, I mean, death is not discriminatory. It, it doesn't no. matter what your age is and, or what your ailment, when it's your time, it's your time. And that's where that distress, that added distress when it happens when you least expect it. And there's just a, a number of things to um, go through. I mean, there's, there's stages of being in the hospital or not in the hospital and from the hospital to the funeral and from the funeral, then the estate planning. There's just so many different stages to go through. There are. There are. Whether to have a service or not have a service. I mean, you know, there's stuff. Right. Uh, And what type of service to have. And yeah, there's a lot to be involved. And, and, um, you know, oftentimes people don't, they don't know what to do, that you're not really sure what to, how, how to, you know, what do I do first? Um, And, you know, it's, it's, it's helpful to have somebody that can guide them. And, and, you know, the, the best thing is to try to work those things out in advance, um, you know, get some of those questions answered and how, how the, how that, how that person wants the things to go, um, how they want their service to be. And that, when that happens, that's, that's really lovely. Yes. Um, when they can actually put all that down for their family and it takes all the stress mm-hmm. and all the pressure off their, especially if they have multiple children, because I've dealt with families where, you know, the kids can't agree on Mm -hmm. how the services and how the after death care should be for their loved one. And that is not the time to be having disagreements, but it happens all the time. Of course. And, and these are the the moments that the emotional distress brings out, not intentionally, but it brings out almost the worst. And it could, because of the fears that are are, um, based around this, but yeah, it's, very difficult when not when everybody is not on the same page well and the other the other thing that happens when you know you're a child and you're dealing with a parent um or especially if it's the last parent you know if maybe your your mom had already passed and now it's your dad's is you know his time is coming 
it it pretty much shines a really big spotlight on your own mortality mm-hmm. and that shakes people if they're not if they haven't had these kind of thoughts or had this these any types of thoughts of the fact that you know look I, you know someday i am going to die most people just kind of brush that off and go yeah someday but that's not going to happen for a long time but when you're dealing with a parent or a spouse or god forbid a child that is starting to transition your own mortality has got a big spotlight on it. And yes. it's oftentimes your judgment gets skewed mm-hmm. because of your own stuff, your own fears, your own concerns. And then you've got to try to deal with the person that's dying. Right. So it's a very stressful, emotional time. And um, there's just not a lot of support out there Um except for doulas, you know, we are, we are more and more talked about I'm, every day. I'm getting notification that there's an article somewhere written mm-hmm. about end of life doulas. Yes. So um, just like a birth doula, you know, right. birth doulas are very popular now. They've been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, end of life doulas also have been around for a long time, but we're starting to be more common because people need the support. They need that emotional support and companionship and maybe they need help with a you know conversation with all the family Mm -hmm. um so that's where we can come in to help absolutely you know and it reminds me of the saying i I grew up with death is what gives life meaning well when you can have that conversation and just like you said it makes you focus on your mortality it also makes you focus on how much you care about that person So living life and just with this assumption of I'm still young and I have plenty of time, which may not always, because none of us are guaranteed tomorrow and none of us know when our time is. So that conversation may be uncomfortable, but at the same time, it may be the thing or the, um, the go getting kind of start of a, a new conversation that bonds you and brings you even closer than you might have been before well yes um and and certainly it has the ability to do that when you're dealing with families and you know everybody can definitely be more bonded because hey now we're all on the same page about Mm -hmm. what mom wants you know that kind of thing but you know personally it's something i always tell people is you know if you can and i this is going to sound very strange but if you can just really embrace the fact that you are going to die Mm -hmm. and really sit with it what it does is it 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 absolutely all of a sudden makes you realize are am i actually doing and living the kind of life i want to live yes because if you can embrace the fact yes i'm going to die it makes your life now that much sweeter it makes your job that much more important. I mean, Mm -hmm. and do you want to stay in that job? Is this a job that you can see yourself doing for the next 20, 30, 40 years, depending on your age? And if it isn't, well, now's the time to start making some changes. Right. Um, Same thing for the marriage, same thing for, you know, a lot of other important things in our life really talking about and embracing death makes us make better choices right now. Mm -hmm. We can have a better life right now. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was a practicing naturopath and helping people overcome illness, overcome disease, using natural medicines, Mm -hmm. those conversations were, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, okay, you've got diabetes. Well, you don't have to have diabetes. There's, there's things that you can do. There's lifestyle changes you can make. This is not the end of the world and let's fix it now. Because if we can get your body working now, it, you're going to have a better end of life as opposed to accumulating all these illnesses right. and taking all these medications that cause more side effects where you need more medications. Mm-hmm. The end of your life is going to look very differently than if you work to take care of it now. I completely agree. Just completely agree. And it's, it brings back to that whole mindset of being proactive instead of reactive. Correct. Yes. It and does. this is what I love that you, you know, your passion for this and that you were driven to be more of that patient advocate and help people in this 
very odd, difficult, different way of life, you know, living and there's where there was a beginning, there's an end and accepting that end. Yeah, it's the acceptance. And it is, you know, that's certainly one of the one of the stages of, of the of the dying process, the grieving process is, is the acceptance part. Mm -hmm. And even if it's 50 years away, you know, we, we don't like you said earlier, we don't know um, our days are our days are numbered. Um, we are all actively dying every day. We're getting closer to when that day is going to mm -hmm. come. Yep. Um, and we just need to <laughs> kind of be more proactive, um, and, and work on, on being open and, and having those conversations. Absolutely. Sometimes the truth hurts and having an end of life doula like Melissa helps to have that objective yet compassionate individual to lean on to get through these emotionally stressful times well and and you know as far as the advocacy part i love doing advocacy work because you know just like what you had said earlier about you didn't even know what questions to ask right. when your dad was ill and that is often the case people don't know what questions to ask they don't um, certainly the patient often doesn't because they're the one dealing with the quote diagnosis and, and maybe it's the end of, Hey, we got to put you on hospice. So maybe it's that quote diagnosis that that is a very hard conversation to have with the patient. Doctors do not have an easy job no. when they have that, but you know, their, their brain, um, goes tilt, um, during that conversation. So they don't know the questions to ask. And oftentimes they just get referred to hospice and off they go. Um, but, but there's, there's a lot more involved. There's a lot of other questions that can be, that can be asked. And even if we don't have a, a hospice or an end of life diagnosis, but we're dealing with an active illness, sometimes the question is, you know, frequently for medical, it's always, well, you know, what else can I take or what else can I do or what other treatment can I try? And the question should, you know, sometimes be, should I do it? Mm. Right. Yes. Because, because the quantity of time that somebody has left doesn't equate to quality. No. And oftentimes the most important thing should be quality of life. I mean, I think that most of us want to have mm -hmm. a good quality, whatever time we have left, we want it to be a good quality. Absolutely. And sometimes treatments can make that not be good. Right. And the, the, the difficult deaths that I've seen, the, the rough deaths, the, the pain that's not easily controlled, and um, those are the ones that kept on with treatments that, you know, maybe they might have made a different decision had they had the information, had they had the, right. the knowledge, and had they asked the right questions that they didn't know to ask, you know, that kind of situation. Absolutely. And that's really what this comes down to. Like we said, getting this education, this knowledge out so that it isn't such a um, scary area to face. Yeah, we, we don't want scary. Um, we no. want knowledge. Yes. Because that makes us powerful. It, and it then... makes it very powerful because we're not working in fear. We're working right. through the knowledge. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Melissa, for taking the time to share this information to us and the listeners. And so how do we, how do our listeners find you to benefit from your services as an end of life doula? Well, um, they can look up my website. It's peacefulendoflife.com. I've got articles out there, resources, information. Um, and of course, you're welcome to contact me and, and we can set up an appointment. I, I work through phone or Zoom or in person here in, uh, in San Antonio. Um, so I'm available to help in whatever way I can. You know, so one thing I do want to kind of make clear to people is you don't necessarily, you don't, in fact, you don't have to be actively um, dying. You don't have to have a diagnosis. You can just have a conversation about death and mm -hmm. we can talk about your ultimate, 
you know, point when you're at that phase or just questions you have about it. I have had consultations with entire families about their loved one who was passing away, a very actively passing away. The loved one was fine. <laughs> she actually was very okay with the fact that she was going to be passing away within the next few days. Um, mm. She was a nurse. She fully knew what was going on. The family, on the other hand, was not handling it well. Mm. Um, it happened fairly suddenly. The doctors just kind of said, yeah, everything's shutting down. There's nothing else we can do. The family didn't know what to do. They didn't handle it well. We've got children scattered all over mm. the United States. And so I had phone calls in Zoom with all the kids and not the actual patient that was dying. Wow. And likewise, I've had conversations with just the patient that was dying and nobody else. Mm. So, you know, we're there to support anybody that, that feels like they want to have a better handle on this death and dying thing. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to make that clear to your listeners. Absolutely. It's such a benefit. You are a benefit to our listeners. Well, I really, really appreciate what you do and, and um, actively trying to help people in the caregiving um, roles and, and those communities, people. And thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to, to talk about end of life doulas and how we can help people. Absolutely. I strongly believe that things happen for a reason, but I also believe that we do better when we know better, just as Maya yes. Angelo said. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. What a, what a beautiful quote to, to end. So on that note, thank you for joining in and listening with us today. You can find more about this topic on the blog at jessicalazelcannon.com, just in case you didn't catch um, her connections on how to find her, Melissa Wood with Peaceful and of Life. I hope this gave you more food for thought. And until next time, be proactive. Take care, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We really hope you've enjoyed this episode. To learn more about proactive caregiving and to hear other episodes of this podcast, please visit www.jessicalazelcannon.com. This podcast is produced by Canon Light Media, LLC, www.canonlightmedia.com. Music provided by Chris Paradise.